Warriors, and welcome to Outlaws to the End. This is the official podcast of the Outlaw Gamers Society, and I am Brent Adams, joined in perpetuity and gladly by Mr. Lauren the Bomb Baumgarten. Lauren, I am so happy to say welcome back. Wow. Uh, that brings back some memories, Brent, I have to tell you. Uh, and in perpetuity is right. I, I hope that we're going to do one of these when we're 85 years old for whoever's left alive listening to our show. Yes. The, I, uh, I, I, note that, I note that the age has gone up because the last episode of Outlaws to the End that we did, you said something similar, but, but the age was 72. The fact that it has now moved to 85 indicates that we have moved substantially closer to the 72 mark. <laughs> That's and right. so they, we are therefore moving the line farther out that's exactly yes. right that's exactly right it's great it's great to be back Brent. i can't wait to do this show i'm very excited to uh to talk about games to talk about the show what it's meant to us uh to talk just to talk to you it's it's fantastic to be doing this again it feels feels like riding a bike it sure does if riding the bike also mm-hmm. includes uh a visit to timeanddate.gov or timeanddate.com and a desperate last minute attempt to remember how to record multi-track audio in two places at once. <laughs> That's right. It's exactly That's right. It's like the same. riding a bike while holding two plates. That's right. So all of that is happiness. It is happiness and joyfulness and the happy, happy joy dance and all of that doing the bull dance, feeling the love, but it has been precipitated by a, 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 a perhaps a sad, perhaps a somber, but simply a milestone that we will be crossing, which is the closing of the website outlawgamers.com. Not because we decided to close it, not because of any any tragic sort of event like that, but simply because our hosting provider engine has decided that they are going to end of life uh, the product, their their website builder product that we had been using. And that's coming to an end, and that means that the website is closing down on April the 30th. It's April the 16th as we record this, so it's a couple weeks out. But uh, that that is essentially uh, what brought us here, uh, and just kind of talking about that event uh, on the phone and saying, so, well, you know, what do we want to do, and yada, yada, yada. And that conversation inevitably led to, hey, we should do another podcast because talking with you is fucking fun. <laughs> that's right, Brent. It is. Uh, it, it is a milestone to be sure, and in, as you said, in lieu of sort of rebuilding the website, we've decided to um, to um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Transition. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, so. To to bring all the content over to Discord, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but uh, migrate was the word I was looking for. Migrate the content over to Discord. As you said, we're getting closer to that age of seventy two. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, it did. It did precipitate a phone call between us and talking about the logistics of that, and and we hadn't talked in a little while, and we got to talking, and and felt like this was a, a good time to maybe put up another show for those people that are still active on the site, and just to get together and and talk and talk about you know it's been five years since we recorded our last podcast, which is just wow, uh, it's crazy to me. Wow, I now have a five year old daughter. Right. Um, you, your daughter is now 27. Yes. Yes, um. she is. Uh, <laughs> and, and she's currently training with NASA. She is the only uh, NASA mission specialist that has degrees in, uh, in uh, astrophysics, uh, law, and ninjutsu. So, you know, that's, that's her... <laughs> That's that's her distinguishing characteristic. That's her claim to fame. Yes, yeah. absolutely. My, my uh, daughter so it is has been... nine, son. My daughter is <laughs> nine years old, which is I know, which is amazing, wild to me. Uh, so yeah, it's been five years since we recorded the last show, and uh, we decided uh, maybe we should do another one. Oh yeah, and it's already it's already a lot of fun for us. Hope it's a lot of fun for you. But uh, to bring it full circle. Um, the short version of this is uh, the website is going to be closing on April 30th. We are migrating the community over to the Outlaw Gamer Society Discord. There is link. Uh, there is a link. There's a, a couple now. I'm going to make them a little bit more prominent, a little bit more easier to find on the existing engine website. So if uh, if you hear this and you're feeling sort of a, a great need to, like, oh, I should I should go and do this because I never signed up for the Discord and I, I want to get in on this. Then uh, you can go to the outlawgamers.com uh, website 
and uh, click on the link to join the Discord. Um, if you're already a member of the OutlawGamers.com uh, engine website, uh, you should be able to get right in. Uh, shouldn't be an issue. So the long and short of it is that I, and, and I, I don't want to make this sort of too self-congratulatory, but I look back on what we did with our community, the fact that, you know, we had such a strong, active, uh, you know, community that was just ravenous to, you know, to just discuss games and, and hardware and, you know, titles and developers and just, you know, all the things going on within the industry, business practices and so forth. And I look back on that community that sort of, you know, came out of that and also the way that we were able to, you know, you know I mean, we, we were, we began crowdfunding ourselves a full year before Patreon came online. And I look at things today like Patreon and discord is another great example I think like, oh man, like that feels like tailor made, uh, you know, for, for what, what we were doing. I think discord's a, a great place. It's a fantastic amalgam of all these different tools for community to come together and to, and to talk like we're doing now face to face, voice to voice, you know, text and all that. And, uh, I'm really, really impressed with how those things have come along over time. And I think that'll be a great fit moving forward. Yeah, it's and so just so li listeners know, if they're not on Discord, Brent, all of the not all of, but most of the functionality, if not all of it, will, that we enjoy on the engine platform, essentially, will be available on Discord. Is that correct? Like, yeah, I people mean, can continue to post articles that they're reading about, yeah. and people can comment on those posts. And absolutely, they do it every day. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. Discord isn't just a, a voice chat, obviously. It's obvious to those who use it regularly, but there's people who don't. Yeah, that's true. It, it's not just for voice chat anymore. You know, that's interesting, Brent, about what you said about um, uh, our, our website basically crowdfunding the podcast a year before Patreon. Um, it's kind of a, it kind of, it, it's a nice segue <laughs> to talk a little bit about how we, we came together. But it, it makes me think of, uh, the reason I say that is because it makes me think of when I first started Furious Gamer Radio, uh, which is how we met, which we'll, we can talk about. Um, I actually, I was just thinking about this today. I, I don't know if you even know this, Brent, but I built, so when I started Furious Gamer Radio, which was I was trying to build a, um, a podcast network, essentially, and I had amalgamated 10 or so, 10, 12 of the, what I think were the, some of the best uh, and most diverse podcasts in at the time, including um, uh, ultimately Epic Battle Cry, Major Nelson, Joystick Podcast. Oh, wow. Uh, with Justin McElroy and his yeah. brothers. Um, I had um, uh, uh, Destructoid on there. I had Cheap Ass Gamers on there. I mean, I had some some really, really great gamer tag radio. The classics. Uh, Uncle Gamer. So, really, like, awesome uh, podcast. And I was trying to build a, a real legit, like, podcast radio network that I, that I actually. Um, got investors for and, and built a business plan and was sending out to VC companies to try and build yeah. like a series to try and sell it to Sirius or XM at the time who we were separate. Um, and in the process of building that, I built a web app and I built an iPhone and an Android app. This is back in 2007, eight and nine when the, when the app store first came out and um, I built a functionality in my, Oh man, I don't know if you remember. I, this, I, I think I know exactly I what you're talking to, about. So yes. two things. One, I used to tag my yep. vision. What there were ten or twelve shows on the network, and my vision was that a gamer would either go and listen to a whole show because they loved the show, or if they were a fan of a specific game and just wanted to hear about that game, I would tag every. I would listen to every episode that got uploaded by all twelve of those shows every week, yep. and personally tag them and enter the tags in. So a gamer could go to any episode or pick a game, actually. They could pick like Call of Duty and it would list all the, the podcasts that were talking about Call of Duty that week and they could jump right to that spot in the episode just so they could just listen to stuff about Call of Duty if they wanted. And it took, I mean, hours and hours and hours of my time every week to do that. I did it all myself. Yep. But also, I designed at the time um, what ultimately Amazon beat me to market with one day, literally a single day, before I launched my app, um, Amazon launched WhisperSync. And at the time, <laughs> there was no application in existence right. uh, that had this. And I designed it for, for my application that if you were listening on your phone and you put your phone down and then went to the web app and picked up where you, it would pick up where you left off. It would remember where you were. It would resume. Um, and, and Amazon 
I mean, literally barely beat me to market with that. Um, and it just makes me think of like so, a, a, some of the innovative stuff that I think maybe we were doing that we didn't even know we were doing at the time. Yeah. Um, Epic Battle Cry, Epic Battle Axe, Epic Battle Cry. I mean, Epic Battle Cry at one point I think had you know a hundred thousand views a week or something crazy like that. I think or more. I think that that, that was pro- uh, like that was like a really good week for us. I think on average, yes, but uh, you know our weekly average was like between thirty and sixty. Tony and I were talking about this recently, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah. Our weekly average was between like thirty and sixty thousand, and then like like an E three episode, we you know we jump up over a hundred thousand or you know yeah i think we had, we had a, more more than a couple episodes over a hundred thousand yeah. which is yeah which you know all of this really speaks to to yours and my inability to uh to monetize this endeavor <laughs> and make it work as, <laughs> as a career uh because we have all this great stuff and and uh and here we are yeah uh but uh it, yeah it, it's we've done we've this has been and it, it continue it has been and continues to be but Really, it just just an amazing ride, and I'm so grateful for the. Uh, it's it's so fun to think about how it all came together and uh, how we met, and to, just to think about. It. I mean, we did we Brent and I um, in preparing for this show, put together how many episodes we did, and and we did Brent and I did 260 episodes together over the between the Axe Factor, uh, the postmortems, the uh, Outlaw Gamer Radio, Outlaws to the End. We did 260 episodes together, which is the equivalent of a weekly episode for five years. And we, we actually did it over longer than that, but yeah. that's how many episodes it is. You guys on top of that, um, you and Daniel and Tony and with me occasionally, mm-hmm. very r- rarely, but occasionally um, did 250 episodes of Epic Battle Cry. That, that's just, yeah. that is an insane amount of content and represents, you know, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten years of our lives together. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. And yeah. And you know, Epic Battle X did, um, we did an, uh, we did a number of other shows as well yep. that did, you know, none of them ran as long, but you know, we had like force feedback. We did, uh, we did under the ax and I think that we did the, um, the on tap. I remember the on taps yep. being very fun. Those were like kind of off the cuff, um, you know, like looking at community comments and just kind of, you know, it, it was almost like, like us talking more directly to the community about what they were talking about and stuff. We did a number of other things as well. None of them, uh, none of them like ran as long as our shows did, but, um, it's an amazing amount of content and we, that doesn't include any of, I mean, I, I, I didn't go back and look, but I mean, all the writing we did for the website, I did. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I did, um, 1500 word columns weekly for, I think I did, you know, close. I can't remember 50, 75 of those, maybe more. As well as all the news stories, the news stories, Plus, all the, I mean, man, we had, we've had, what a great community we've had. Um, we've gotten to interview some incredible, incredible developers, yeah. uh, authors. Ernest Klein was on the show twice. Yeah. Um, I, Jess Condit was on, you know, started at Epic Battle Axe and was worked with us. She's now the senior editor at, at uh, Engadget. Engadget. I, yeah, I was, was trading emails with Jess a couple of years ago and, uh, just, uh, and you're know, just kind of marveling. I mean, and the thing is like, like I, that was pretty firmly in Jess's sights back when we knew her. I mean, you're like, like, oh, yes. like her, her trajectory was very, very clear to her. And, you know, she, I mean, she, the whole reason that, you know, like Daniel, like reached out to her is cause she was obviously talented. She, uh, she had the background in journalism. She was really interested in games. And it's, it's super rewarding to see her in that position now. Uh, just, you know, just knowing how focused driven she was on achieving that. And, uh, and the fact that she did is, is fan freaking fantastic. It is indeed. We, we, I remember so many things stand out to me. I remember, um, interviewing the fellows, <clears throat> interviewing the guys at Red Links. Yeah. <laughs> about trials. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was, I remember I was on vacation with my wife coordinating that. Yeah that interview I was so excited to, to talk to those guys. And one of the other, um, uh, developer stories that uh, will always stand out in my mind is the guys who, who, uh, were listeners are, were, uh, of the show mm-hmm. at white paper games. That was, that was amazing. Uh, that, that was one of those like really cool. I don't know. It was just like, like one of those, like, like really, really cool confluences of like circumstance and people and everything where, what you're doing is kind of feeding into something that they're doing. They're doing is feeding into what you're doing. That was, uh, that, that was, it was a really, really fun 
circumstance specifically just uh just be and it didn't you know it didn't hurt that that game was so good that's uh, right ether one is the game we're talking oh about. yeah thank you uh ether yeah. one was so so good i i I think of, I, I, you know, and I, I live streamed almost a hundred percent of my play on that. Um, Oh, I don't, re- I didn't remember that. I did. I live streamed a lot of, of my playing of ether one, which was hilarious at times because <laughs> I would, you know, I'd like, I'd be searching around for, you know, some, some puzzle. I, I remember one in particular, <clears throat> it's like, like you're like down in like in a cave somewhere, like the mines. And I, I can't remember exactly what the puzzle was, but I know like it had something to do with like candles and uh i was like completely overlooking the you know the the, the trick to the puzzle like, like i i like i wasn't like i was like there's a puzzle here i i hear voices where's the puzzle you know i was like completely uh missing it and, and, and your people would chatter like okay go back turn no turn turn left no your other left turn to turn too far back to the right okay forward for stop for the love of god stop you know and uh jesus this is stressing me out listening to you describe what it was like watching you play so anyway at, at times at times it was it was really cool and like everything was going smooth and i was like oh there's there's this and there's this and you know and then at other times it was that i do remember there was one puzzle it's something to do you remember like the puzzle that had to do with like the it's like the smokestacks in that uh, that sort of like old industrial complex, and I remember like I I can't remember how I solved it. Like I can't remember what the mechanics of the puzzle actually are, but I was like I solved the puzzle in a way that it was not designed to be solved. I like I was like looking I'm like okay so like there's one like if I stand here there's like one one smokestack there and then if I go here I can see two smokestacks okay and I go back over to like this board and I'm like you know doing blah 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 and James was in chat and he was and he was saying something like like this is fucking crazy like I I I don't I can't remember exactly what he said I'm paraphrasing but he was like this <laughs> is nuts like this like like you're not solving the puzzle the way that we the way we designed it we designed yeah. for it to be solved but what you're doing is going to work anyway and i was just like that's fucking cool <laughs> yeah they, they they were they are i'm sure still are great guys i haven't talked to them in a while mm. they're still making games as far as i know they're they their company just turned 10 years old they've made two games since ether one um and just to have them as part of the community that 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 was a you know, we talked, like I said, to a lot of developers and authors, but there, that was a very special, uh, special thing for us both. I think. Yeah, um, it was. It was indeed. It has been. It has been a uh, amazing journey. I think back. I I did this show while I was in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, oh man, I forgot for about two that. Two years living internationally, yeah, oh, yeah. Occasion, right. occasionally getting stalked by you know members of the of uh brazil's criminal net uh criminal underground <laughs> i remember i remember you telling me one time about like a couple of guys were following you on the street and you like you like ducked into a bodega and you came out later and they were still there like waiting for you or something you had to that i took care of that it's not, not a big deal I, I deal with that all the time <laughs> um uh yeah it, it um you know we we both had children yeah uh our you know uh our friends of course have had children i've had friends and family pass away while we were doing this i mean mm-hmm. just it's so much stuff and we put i mean the amount of hours that we have both put into this starting in i don't actually know i started this started sort of down this road in 2007 i think right is when i started working on furious gamer i don't know that's probably i'm guessing that's about the same time you started with epic battle axe i'm guessing it's a little earlier we start like uh i was just i was just recounting this uh, for that, uh, that that post on the website i did uh, a few weeks back but uh we started EpicBattleAxe.com started on Blogger summer of 2008. And we switched to Squarespace, which which they're still around. That's kind of fun. But we moved to Squarespace about the same time that the podcast got picked up as a video show on GameTrailers.com in October of 2008. And so, like, I've always kind of considered October 2008, like, that was sort of, like, like we kind of soft launched in the summer, and, but the, the real kind of hard launch was October 2008 for us. Gotcha. And I think October 2008, I think 
I th- I'd have to go back and look. I think I launched Furious Gamer Radio. I actually launched it. Mm-hmm. I was working on it for a long time before I actually launched it. Um, I think I launched in the spring of two- February or maybe in the spring of 2009. Yeah. I'd have to go back. So it was shortly. I actually think I launched without Epic Battle Axe. Mm. Uh, Epic Battle Cry, excuse me, and um, and then came across the the podcast and was so blown away by the the level of quality. It was so obviously sort of in a different um, stratosphere of quality relative to most of, almost all of the other yeah. podcasts, if not all of them. And sort of, and that's why I immediately reached out to you guys. But it was so. I think I went. I, I think I launched in two thousand nine, but I had been working on it since I think the end of two thousand seven. Right. I mean, um, we were we were at. The first time you and I met was at E3 2009. So it was, it was a, was that really 2009? I think, I think it was, I think it was E3 2009 was the first time you and I met. And I didn't know. Yeah. I must've gone that first year we got. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if you know this, Brett, I, there's no reason for me not to say it now, but I got, I had $50,000 in investment for furious gamer between me and two other investors, which, uh, especially at the time, but even now, yeah. um, was a lot of money. Oh yeah, um, no doubt. And uh, again, speaks to our my inability to <laughs> <laughs> to turn it into a, a money making offer. And we went out to E three. One of my partners and I went out to E three to um, to try and sell Furious Gamer Radio. At that point, we I had spoken to Gabe Newell, who gave us um, an endorsement. I had spoken, obviously, you know, you guys and Daniel had given us an endorsement. I had an yeah. endorsement from. Uh, the the chief editor of I think it was Edge magazine or mm. or one of the gaming magazines the the um uh and we were we headed out to E three to try and sell uh, Furious Gamer Radio and you guys were out there to cover it yeah um and that's when we first met yep. in person which yeah. was pretty cool that was fun it, yeah. it was a lot of fun one of my abiding memories is uh you and I I don't remember how it how it, it came down to you and I, but somehow you and I were the ones. They were like, okay, so two people can go to the closed doors 2K booth. It was not like on the floor. Like you had like you know you had to have an invite. You had to go you know like you, there was a bouncer, blah blah blah. And you and I uh, wound up being the two from our group yeah. that went to. Was the, it Mafia that year? It was Mafia? We saw the- we saw Mafia. We saw. Remember yeah. that? Remember that first person shooter XCOM game that was just kind of wa- yeah. wallowing in development hell for years and years and years. Yeah. And I think they finally put it out as like XCOM mm-hmm. the Bureau or some some shit like that. Yeah. But it got completely undercut by XCOM Enemy Unknown. You know, like a year or two later when that came out. Yeah. But uh, we went back there. And we met a handful of people from Rockstar that had worked on Red Dead Redemption. Uh, and we discovered that they had a, uh, a f- they had a free bar. And so basically, uh, that episode ended with like Lauren dragging me by the feet out of the booth. And I'm like, no, free beer, no, I'm never leaving. <laughs> and he's like, we got to go, we got to go check out Batman Arkham City. Come on. Uh, oh, Batman city um the uh you know all of that stuff brent i gotta say that for me you know it turned it ultimately did turn in i worked as a in the industry a little bit i worked as a community manager for uh hb studios well, yeah they made that uh, golf game that you you'd uh, the golf club which is play. now yeah, yeah it's, it's now owned by um 2k and it's it's the like pga tour 2k game now oh wow um, but i did that i i worked for a little it ultimately led me to that job for, uh for a while which i really really enjoyed it just didn't pay enough um yeah and unfortunately sadly um they tried to get me to move to nova scotia canada which we almost did uh uh lunenburg it's it looks beautiful right um but all of that stuff um w- which is incredible and you know one of the things that amazes me the most uh not one of the things the thing that amazes me the most which is why we, why we're doing this now is um, is the community the 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 fact that that um, I, I don't want to say we I want to say we were able to put together a community but I, it, it's not us I mean part of it is because we really so so a lot of it's tied to the fact that how heavily we moderate our community and we insist on a certain um, we have certain expectations around behavior and conversation and so forth that we've had yeah you know tremendous help with moderators uh, uh, keeping in check not that we've had to do much of it honestly. Um, if you want to know how but, dedicated the, the 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 staff, the moderating staff is, I added a <laughs> bot called Craig Bot to the Discord server so that we could record this conversation. And within minutes 
of adding that bot, <laughs> Esteban Manriquez was private messaging me and saying, "How do I get rid of this bot? I got to kick this. I got to kick this bot, son of a bitch, out of this server. <laughs> like minutes. This isn't supposed to be here, you know." <laughs> and I was like, "It's cool. Like, please, you know, please don't don't kick the bot. We're using it right now." That's how dedicated the staff is. After all of these years, the moment that Esteban smelled something south of Munster Cheese, he was on that shit. <laughs> it's like Sunday afternoon. He's, I'm sure he's got a million things going on. Right. Right. And he, and he noticed it's, we've had a really incredible, incredible <laughs> staff. Amazing people. Over the years. And, but, but the community has managed to put together a community mm. of, of just, the the level of and type of discourse on our website and our shows and comments and you know among the community members who you and I still continue to play games with from time to time sometimes more than others but yeah um it, it's just in, incredible it's just a, a a group of of you know a, a group of thoughtful intelligent people across the across the globe uh too which is another thing that's really uh, exciting yes um, having just wonderful thoughtful conversation about games in every corner of games too not it's you know it's just it's just an incredible incredible community and it's such a, a joy to to see it is uh, it, you and you just hit upon one like one of the biggest things for me like one of the biggest things for me was how many people from how many different places around the world uh you know we ended up meeting and interacting with uh and i yeah i mean you know like the 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 group that i regularly uh you know game with uh, you know, all members from our community, Lance in Japan, Neil, uh, Neil UK, Neil McCauley. I can't remember what, what he goes by on the site now. And then, and then Fatui, yeah. you know, uh, Lance, Lance is from the States, but you know, he's lived in Japan for many, many, many years. Neil's from the UK, Fat's from Denmark. And like every time, like, you know, we've like hung out and, uh, you know, played games or, or you know, just hung out and chatted fascinating you know to like you know instantly be getting like these three different perspectives from three different countries about yeah like you know whatever it is like you know politics or you know like like you know the movie uh, the movie theater business or streaming stuff or you know video games whatever that that that's the thing that i think i'm maybe the most thank thankful for is just the opportunity to meet and interact with so many different people so many different places it really helped to give me a much bigger perspective on on the world and the issues in the world uh, and, uh, and I, I'm, I'm so thankful to, you know, to have had, had that opportunity. Yeah. Brent and I really, I mean, it's really, again, why we want to do this podcast. We want to, and we will just rest assured, by the way, if you're listening to this and you don't care about any of this crap, we will be talking about games just to give you a little bit of the old school, um, X factor outlaw gamer, excuse me, outlaw gamer radio. But, um, uh, Brent and I really wanted to to put together one more episode, not to say that we'll never do one again, but we really were sort of moved to do another episode. And particularly, like you said, at this milestone of, of sort of shutting down outlaw gamer, um, gamers.com, the logos of which, by the way, were designed from, by a member of our community, which I love so much to this day. That's exactly right. Um, um, you know, we kind of wanted to mark this milestone and just take the opportunity to, to say thank you to, the community to all of you people all of you guys who are still listening and and who have listened over the years uh even if you're not participating in the website and and you just happen to see this this podcast episode go up we just wanted to say say thanks to everybody and also to to say thanks to each other and get get on the get on the bike one more time and go for a ride hell yeah and with that in mind let's do it i just realized we don't have those musical interlude sections to break this up so that that actually doesn't work for this show anymore. That's that's like more of a Axe Factor Outlaw Gamer Radio thing. Can you can you use them? Um, Technic have them still. Or? I mean, I I could. Yes, actually, one of the more interesting uh, things that came out of doing Epic Battle Cry is when we first started doing Epic Battle Cry, we were not paying attention to like licensing stuff like at all, and so and and you know basically Daniel left the production of the show uh, to me and, and and Tony. I mean, like really, like we. Tony and I were the ones that kind of like, you know, like the format of the show, the fact that like there would be like musical interludes between each section, like that was all kind of Tony and I's brainchild. And so the music was entirely, you know, like down to me, like as the editor, like I had, you know, control over that ultimately. And so I was just like, what's a band that not enough people listen to entombed. And so I just threw in tons uh, of music from, you know, my favorite uh, Swedish death metal band. 
and um and uh when we got picked up on game trailers they just kept on using it and i was like they never asked and <laughs> you know like it's on them if they hey never guys asked. Eventually, well, this is a actual band. Eventually, uh, eventually, they were like, "Yeah, like, do you have the rights to this music?" And we were like, "Define rights," and um, <laughs> and then and then we had then we had to change it. But uh, for a while there, we were just we were just you know we were just breaking the law with that shit. Where was our music from? Uh, the Axe Factor music was also so the original Axe Factor music that dun 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 OGS dun 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 that that was also an entomb song. Uh, when we went to OGS. I got us a, um, I, I, I did that proper. I went and got us a, uh, like a royal, like a royalty free, uh, you know, track from, you know, or, you know, a track from a royalty free music website. Uh, and, and, and as is the track uh, we have now, we have a hundred percent rights yeah. to use that now. So yeah. not breaking the law anymore. So can, so can we, do you still have them downloaded somewhere that we can use them for interludes here? Or should we Ooh, them? yeah. Like I might, like I might be able to kind of throw, I might be able to go back. I'd, I'd have to look, but I, I might still have those. Yeah. You know, I actually don't know if we just had a musical interlude. I can't remember if that was this show or Outlaw Gamer Radio <laughs> or the Axe Fact. I might be confusing our our podcasts. Uh, so, so it may it may be like, and we're back, or it may be like just awkward silence. Was, we we never laughed, right? Yeah, yeah okay. I don't know. Fair enough. We're gonna we're, fair enough, but we're tr- we're gonna transition to actually talking about games now. Yeah, <laughs> we'll find out. So. Um, I guess let's just talk about like what we've been playing lately. Which I, I have to say that uh, for me. I went through after Z was born. I went through a number of years where I didn't get to play much at all. Uh, you know, just life and everything that was kind of going on with you know the family uh, really uh, became a lot harder to uh, you know to like kind of balance with any gaming stuff. Honestly, like I look back, like I have no idea how Daniel ever did all the things that he did, and he had he had two going like he had he had his third child while we were uh like during like the epic battle axe years uh i have no i don't know idea. how we did just that For, forget the anything else i i have a uh, we have one child as do you i don't know how a human being has three children yeah exists beats me beats me but anyway um so i have i've i've definitely been playing less in recent years but um i have uh i have been playing some so i think uh i'll start off with and w- we'll I'll talk about this. I mean, it'll kind of come back around because, like, we're going to do a thing later. We're kind of talk about like our biggest anticipated games. One of the games that I really, really fucking got into it was a huge Kickstarter success. Was Divinity: Original Sin Two from Larian Studios? They make, for my money, the best turn-based uh, strategy role-playing game, maybe that I've ever played. Uh, and the fact that it's co-op, the fact that like, like, uh, uh, Neil Lance and, uh, Alpaca Chino, we played that game from start to finish the whole thing. And it was an amazing experience. And one of the games that I have played lately, I'm really looking forward to this year is Larian is doing Baldur's Gate three. They are, you know, they, they got the, the, the license to do Dungeons and Dragons fucking video game, Baldur's Gate from Wizards of the Coast. Uh, and they're doing Baldur's Gate three. It's been in steam early access for God, I don't even know, like I, probably years, but, uh, it's been steam early access for a while. It's coming out this August. That game is, I mean, it was amazing in early access. Like, 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 you know, me and the gang, we played it, uh, you know, Fett, Neil and Lance, we played it. Like the, the, whatever the opening chapter was like twice, uh, you know, cause you know, they, they've gone back and they've updated it, you know, like, you know, the, came out originally, we played it and then like, you know, they did like a major patch, added more stuff in, unlocked more things, new locations, new characters, new cut scenes, you know, uh, tweak mechanics and stuff like so that. So it's not the whole game. It's just, it's a, yeah. just a piece of the game. The, so, so what's been, I, I don't know how they're describing it now, but, uh, I think that, like back when we were playing it, they were kind of referring to like what was in the, in the early access was essentially like chapter one of the game. And you, you could, I mean, there was definitely stuff that, you know, we missed, like, you know, we didn't like try to go everywhere, do everything, but you know, you could get through it in a matter of hours, like single digit hours. Um, and you know, you get to this point and it would kind of like go to a cut scene and be like, okay, you know, that, that's it. You know, thanks for checking out the early access. We'll see you again when the full game launches, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's coming out finally in August and I am, I'm ravenous for that. Um, 
Is that turn based also? Yeah. Which which I is, didn't realize that Divinity Sin original Sin two was was the original. <laughs> I don't the original Divinity original <laughs> well, Sin. Was that turn based? I didn't play the I didn't play the original. Uh, or actually, no, I take oh, that back. I did, but I did not play it much. Uh, but I believe it, I believe it was turn based as well. Okay, um, I didn't remember. Yeah. I tried to play that game. Honestly, I I tried to play it because I thought of it as sort of a Diablo esque, mm. you know, kind of a game. And so I I tried the, the original Divinity Original Sin. Yeah, and it just didn't. It was it was too much for me. It was too in depth. It was too. It was more than I wanted. Yeah, yeah. I think you know for me. As a D and D player, uh, you know, going back to like high school and stuff, uh, you always, you, you know, which like you know, back in the day, like you know, the, the the game, the video games that sort of scratched that itch were things like you know, like the original Final Fantasy games and Ultima and stuff like that. Um, so I'm always kind of like on the lookout for, you know, like games that kind of slot into that. Uh, and Divinity Original Sin two, very much so, and. and as was evidence, I mean, you know, the uh, Larian Studios, you know, they they did like these great, they they had great social media presence. They they would do like these great behind the scenes making of videos for YouTube and stuff. And one of the videos they did was, um, the uh, you know, the, the gang from Larian going out to Seattle visiting Wizards of the Coast, and uh, basically make you know doing some kind of deal with them to bring uh the it was it, it was like. It was like the uh, sort of like the starter set for D and D. Like you could go into like a retail store, like a Target or you know like a Barnes and Noble, and you could buy this box set called the D and D starter set. And it had an adventure called the Lost Minds of Fandelver. The idea was you know you take this thing home, you pop open the box, you'd read through some stuff, and you would play Dungeons and Dragons like that night. And they you know so it, it's like for a lot of people who play D and D, like their first their first adventure was the Lost Minds of Fandelver. Larian adapted the Lost Minds of Fandelver into. Uh, Divinity Original Sin 2 and th- this you know eventually led to like you know they kind of created like a game master mode like where you could you know essentially kind of play it like Dungeons and Dragons where you'd have kind of a game master who would like create the world and like set up enemies and you know just using like all their assets and like their 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 in-game tech and then like other people would connect to it network and you know you'd kind of play it as if it were a D&D session so I uh, it was obvious that they always loved Dungeons and Dragons it was obvious that the game was built by people who had played D and D and were kind of thinking in that way. So to for it to kind of come full circle and then to do like an honest to goodness real D and D game is Chef's Kiss. You know, awesome. <laughs> that is not what a that's Chef's awesome. Kiss uh, sounds like, by the way. That was more about. No, it. that's. But uh, that's smart. anyway, <laughs> right? But anyway, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, Baldur's Gate three. That's a big one for me. I, I'm, yeah. I've I've really enjoyed it. Uh, it. I know it's kind of controversial because the original Baldur's Gate games were not turn-based strategy they were real time uh you know like real time strategy with pause i guess and um anyway i don't know all the lingo anymore but uh mm-hmm. i for one uh think that uh larian is going to be a great great fit for this game so uh looking forward to it but anyway that's that's my awesome. that's my first on this list what about you you want to you want to go back and forth a little bit sure yeah. we so uh, again we're going to talk about kind of what we've been playing recently um we're not going to try and catch you guys up on five years of gaming like brand i uh, obviously, as a, as a parent, I, I do less gaming than I did previously. Um, uh, although not an always true when my daughter was a baby, I, I might have done more gaming yeah, at that point. Same but, with me. Um, now she wants to talk to me, and so it just screws everything up. <laughs> um, but I do think I'm, I don't know. Maybe I've been playing more than you, Brent. You really, it's about getting your priorities straight, and I think that's important to be honest okay, about. Yeah. You know, gaming just has to be number one. All right, that's just the way it needs to be. You've convinced but, um, me. <laughs> um, I guess I'll stick with a little bit with your um, uh, early access theme for for now, which is one of the games I've been playing. Although I, I did stop playing it maybe three or four week three weeks ago or whatever, was the early access um, of Sons of the Forest. Right. Um, that game. Which looks I, have int- you played this game? I've not. I've I've been watching it closely. It looks really interesting. Looks really. So interesting. did you play? Did you play the forest? No, I'm familiar with it. Didn't play it. So I didn't play The Forest either. I had no idea what that game even was, really. When yeah. Sons of the Forest came out uh, in early access, it just immediately shot to the top of the Steam sales, and and uh, it was all over the place. So I was like, eh, I'll take a look at this game. And I watched the, some info about it. It just sounded really interesting, so I decided to dive in. And it was better than I could have imagined. And it was, I'll just say, it, it, it it's like playing a video game version of, the, of Lost. Right. Of the TV show Lost. Right. It's really... Um, it really feels like that. You don't have any idea what's going on. It's it's sort of like half 
there's there's this weird it's like half building simulator and half um you know sur- survival horror i guess i would say or more it's i yeah. mean it's yeah yeah, yeah. It, the i mean they're they're iterating very significantly every couple weeks um i wish honestly I wish I probably I probably think I wish I would have waited until the, the re- full release because mm-hmm. I played that game to about the extent I feel like I'm going to play it before they even got to the yeah the third update. Um, I've done that too. That was that was like me Day Z like 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 when Day Z like yeah, finally like right. officially launched. I was like I'm kind of done with it. And the changes they made sound like I'm reading the changes. I'm like oh those sound incredible. That would have been so cool. But I don't necessarily want to go back and replay the game more. You know. Yeah. Um. But How, I, if you're at all. If you, if you don't mind me just asking you, like, I'm kind of no. curious about, I'm curious about the building. I'm curious about like kind of how the base building mechanics work and everything. Could you, could you just kind of speak to your experience with that just a little bit? Well, it's weird because uh, again, the, the, the changes every three weeks, I think is their cadence right now. Mm-hmm. Um, or was it the beginning ish? Um, the changes are significant. So, uh, the base building was, uh, it was a lot of it's, and it's also weird because when you start the game, um, you don't fully understand what's happening. And so it takes, I mean, it took me uh, many hours before I really understood all the mechanics of the game. Right. Um, I, I mean, I was probably, geez, I don't know, 15 hours into the game before I totally understood everything. Um, so the base building, you know, I'm reticent to say, Brent, only because, only because I don't want to predispose you or anybody to either to, to, to get or not get the game. Right. But, um, also considering that you know, you, it may have significantly changed since you played it. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so I mean, ultimately I my experience of it in the very earliest part of early access was the base building was tons of fun and you could build, you could build anything from a tiny log cabin all the way up to like a mansion made of logs suspended in trees. <laughs> um, and it's really well done. It's really easy to use. You have to trop down the forest. Uh, you have a, a, a AI friend with you who you can send to trop down trees and you can build like, you know, um, uh, log storage facilities so you can have this guy chop down trees and fill up your log storage facilities right and then you could build you know furniture inside of it place to sleep so you can save your game and you could do lighting effects and walls to try and keep out zombies if you can and yeah uh, it's really fun it's really well done there's recipes for basic building but you can get super ornate and i and i spent hours and hours and hours and hours building until and this is where i don't know what's changed in the game until i decided um decided slash found out that i there wasn't really much of a reason for it to build at all yeah um and so i mean at first when i played the game i felt like i need to figure out how to build because i need to home base i need a place to store supplies i need to be able to find a place where i can protect those supplies and myself from the zombies blah 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 blah. and so i thought it was an important mechanic in the game and not just fun and then i i struck out and just said i'm gonna i have to leave the the base and i you know i thought i'd build different bases all throughout the island right so i would have but i struck out and realized like i don't really have any need for a base at all i can do all of this with just the basic tent they give me yeah and managing my supplies and so there's not a, a need for gameplay purposes to build it's more like is it just fun yeah now i don't know if that's changed or not uh, that that may not be true at all anymore i mean there may now be more of a need they're changing how the seasons and the weather affects um, so food and supplies and stuff like that. And so it may not be possible anymore to get through without building at all. Um, but it was addictive. I mean, the building was very addictive. I was watching, I was watching videos on how to build yeah. houses in the game because it yeah. was just so cool to see what people were doing and, and how yeah. to do it. And so uh, it's a really, really good game. It's, it's really, uh, the building part is a lot of fun. The story um is is very to me was very interesting and very well laid out and uh the mechanics were well done the the, just the the, uh the ui and ux and uh how you interact with your gear and all that stuff i thought was very well done um i highly recommend it i don't want to get into it too much more than that because it's really a game about discovering the mechanics and the story uh, occur through discovery it's not done through narrative storytelling so much yeah yeah yeah. uh, or direct narrative storytelling and so i don't want to Say too much more. I, I just would say that I absolutely, a hundred percent recommend it to anybody who looks at a couple of videos and thinks it might be interesting. Which I certainly have done that. I I had uh, Neil and Fett and I played Conan Exiles. Uh, I guess it's been a year or two ago now. And Let me interrupt you for one sec. Yes. 
I apologize, Brent, but in fact, what you just said reminded me the entire game can be played co-op, by the way. That that's huge. I mean, that, that, you know, and that, like, that's, that's one of the things I always look for in a game these days. Um, but we, we played Conan Exiles and like that sort of, that was sort of like my, like, like where I dived off the deep end into like the base building stuff was in Conan Exiles. And oh, yeah. I, like, we were like, we were like building like ridiculous, you know, like, 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 uh, like if they were like, if you unearth the ruins of the shit we built, you know, it would be like the ninth wonder of the world. Um, we were just people going, are building like that in sons of the yeah, forest. We, yeah. we, like we were going crazy. Like I, like I was building like sky bridges between mountains and shit like that, <laughs> you know, just like going nuts. It was so much fun. Um, and, and honestly, like, I mean, like the, the reason that we kind of, and Conan Exiles is, it, I, it sounds very similar in the sense that like, there's kind of a story going on, but it's, it's very, it's very sort of loose. You've got to kind of discover it. It's not like they're not really holding your hand and saying, you know, go here, fetch this, come back, you know, give item, get new quests. Like, it's not like that at all. There's, there's, you know, a, a vague sort of narrative going on. You can kind of explore and, you know discover some some interesting kinds of things and stuff but it's it's all very very low key uh you know for, for better or worse I, I you know some people like that more than others uh but anyway we stopped playing conan exiles and when i saw sons of the forest like i was kind of getting a little bit of that like hmm this seems a little like you know blah 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 so it's one i've had my eye on but it's definitely one we want to wait for until the full game you know kind of comes out like neil and fett like they're kind of like this is this is buggy like this is pretty bad. And like I like I don't care about that stuff so much. Like I got a high tolerance for that. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't I didn't find it to be very buggy or not buggy. Not that wasn't a problem for me. Oh no, no I'm, really... I'm I'm talking about Conan. I'm talking about Conan. Let, oh, let, I got you. That, right. That was why we stopped playing it. So if the game is pretty polished, then that might be the one. No, it's very it's very playable. It's not it's not buggy at all. Okay. It's really it's just that they're I think they're realizing with the everybody playing in early access. Right. They're they're realizing uh, you know where their gaps are or whatever and they're correcting them in real time and the changes they're making are significant they're adding different tools and right. um, you know devices and yeah it's re- it's uh, it's really good though I highly recommend it that's cool let's uh, let's take a second and step back into the time machine a little bit um, one of the things that we were both very very excited about as a result of reading Ready Player One uh, was virtual reality. And, you know, we were really following a lot of like that, that early VR stuff, uh, you know, back, I mean, back, you know, when Palmer Lucky was doing the Oculus before Facebook got involved, before Facebook became meta and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. I bought uh, the first two. That's right. Oculus. That's right. Oculi. I think you got, yeah. I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, didn't you like go through some stuff because like you had pre-ordered it, but now you had to like have it delivered to you when you were living in Brazil and there was a little bit of a thing with that and. Uh, I did. That was, I got the developer kit, uh, uh, and I had to have it delivered to me in Brazil or maybe it was the second one. I can't remember, but yeah, I got the first two, which are now both in a closet in my office. Right. So (laughs) just looking around at the VR landscape, I mean, I, I think that a lot of us, I think a lot of people read ready player one and got really, really excited about VR. And there was a lot of hot and heavy interest in VR for a number of years. And now VR is here. It's, it's main, you know, like I can, I can go to target right now and buy like an Oculus, you know, like whatever, like the, you know, like the, the meta quest to whatever, whatever the current one is, I can, you know, get that at target now and, you know, bring it home and, you know, start playing beat saber or whatever it's here. It's mainstream, but is it what you thought VR would or could be? Um, So here's what I would say to that. Uh, yes and no. So I so first of all, I stopped I stopped pl- using my VR actually while I had the the second uh, while I well while the second um, unit that I had, which was the first consumer unit, um, was still the current unit. I actually stopped when Palmer Lucky sold it to. I think this is when I stopped when he sold the company to Facebook, mm-hmm. and you were required to have a Facebook account right. to use it at that point. Right. Um, which I don't have, and was, had no, in, had, and purposefully have no interest in having, and yeah. and 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 shelved my Oculus because of it. Um, and and maybe they had moved on to the second consumer version. I'm not sure at that point, but I, you know, my the technology was still that I had was still very viable, and I made a choice not to 
because of the 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 requirement to have a Facebook account. Um, I, I guess I would say. You, so therefore, I haven't played. I haven't used a device since that first consumer device. I have never put on a, a Quest or Quest Two. I have never put on a the more recent Vives. I have never put on PSVR or PSVR Two. Um, and so, in term, when you ask if it's is is um, VR where I thought it would be, technologically, I can't answer that question because I haven't seen it. I will say that I, I think it's taking a bit longer to. Um, uh, for the price point to come down and for the for the technology to ramp up, right? And I think that's sort of what's holding it back from becoming um, as mainstream and as high quality as it could be. Is I don't think the technology is advancing. It doesn't seem like the technology is advancing fast enough that there's been huge leaps in the quality of VR. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, this is all based on what I'm seeing, you know, in in reading and reports and stuff, not personal experience. Um, gotcha. It doesn't seem like the technology is advancing enough that the the quality in the VR. Is, is getting significantly better. The price points are coming way down and, and the device itself is is becoming yeah, smaller and you know smaller and more manageable. Yeah. Right. I mean it's it's absolutely um, better than it was, you know, eight, eight, nine years ago when I was using it in that, you know, the quest is obviously a higher quality device than the one I was using. It's wireless and that sort of thing. Um, but now you have AR uh, starting to come up. Yep. And that technology is smaller, and that technology, uh, you know, it's essentially like a kind of a large pair of glasses. Um, it, it is price point wise, I think uh, uh, it's more affordable. I mean, I think the the sort of hotness right now, I think, is three forty nine for the AR glasses. I can't remember the name of the device right now. I don't know if you know it, um, but there is sort of a new hotness in the AR space. It's like I think it's three forty nine, and you can, you know, theoretically, it, it gives you a hundred and I can't remember what it is. 130 inch screen in front of you to play games on in AR, which ain't bad. Um, in 1080p, um, and it's supposed to be all the the reviews I've read of it um, say it's really pretty good. Um, so I I don't know where it's going to go from here. I don't know if AR or VR is going to sort of win out ultimately, or if they'll come together at some point. Uh, it, it's not at Brent as advanced as I as I had thought or hoped it would be at this point in its development. I thought it was moving faster. Yeah. I, at this point, I have had exactly one VR experience, which was PlayStation VR. Uh, we're visiting my family. My sister had it. I asked her about it and she set me up and I can't remember what the name of the, uh, the game was, but it, it was like, a you're, you're, you're like, a you're diving like on this, like submarine wreck in the ocean. And I think you're like trying to recover, I want to say like you're trying to recover like uh was it subnautica? Yeah, may- maybe. Uh but you're like yeah. trying to like recover something from the sub and then like you and you're you're getting like menaced by like a great white shark while you're down there. That kind of thing. And it went pretty well. Right I, and like and you know I'm doing this for whatever, you know, 15 20 minutes whatever it is. And this is the first generation PSVR. Quality was, you know, pretty good. Probably not not what you would get like on PC. I'd I'd imagine it would be better there. But um, it was pretty good, and the experience was was really fun, and it was you know it was impressive. I was like, oh wow, this is pretty cool. And then like right at the end, right at the end, like I, I like I'm I'm you know like I've moved back over to like the diving cage. I'm getting in to get pulled up, and then like you know and the shark is you know kind of like you know swimming around hunting you, and I just did a thing where I kind of like I turned my head to the left and then kind of quickly to the right a little too quickly. And I got motion sick bad, like yeah. bad. And it really, I got to say it pumped my brakes a bit because I started thinking like, what if I go and invest, you know, like whatever, like a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, whatever, like the vibe was going for at the time. Like, what if I go and invest like a significant chunk of change in the VR? And it turns out that like. I, I just can't, I just can't stomach it. Like, like the, the like the motion sickness thing is going to be a, an ongoing problem for me. And I can't really enjoy this, you know, this gaming device that I've invested a lot of money in and it slowed me way down. And, you know, since like the, since the, the, the only, the only ones that I've really kind of considered, uh, just because I think like the quality to price point ratio is pretty good is like, like the meta, like the quest and the quest Two, the wireless ones. 
uh i mean like they raised the price on the on the quest too i think last year but i mean like they were going for like 250 ish or something like that for a while like they were they were relatively affordable uh they might be a little bit more expensive now but i kind of thought like you know like if i like if i spend 250 300 bucks and this doesn't work out uh eh, you know it's not it's not the end of, it's not a thousand you know it's not the end of the world but um I'm not crazy about, you know, look for the reasons that you listed, having to have a Facebook account and all that stuff, which I do have, but I just, I don't know. I kind of like resent the, I think the they're actually model. changing that too. Uh, oh, well, okay. Well then, you know, that, that, that's good news then maybe I think about it, but anyway. Well, the weird thing is with that is you still have to have a, a meta, uh, I mean, you still have to have an Oculus account right? or whatever they, what you still have to make an account with their game store, which is essentially a Facebook, you know, I mean, they're cut, the company owns it. It's a meta account. I got you. Right. So just by so it's kind of weird. Like you don't have to have a Facebook account, but you'll have to have a Meta account, and now those are basically the same right. thing. Which, if you have a Facebook yeah. account, you've already got a Meta account, so why not use That's it? Right. Yeah. Anyway. That's right. Anyway, so I've, I've I don't know if you remember Brent, that. but when I got the first unit, it was it cost me I think six hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, or, or around there, and uh, I put it on, and I I was nauseous for three days. <sighs> I mean days. Yeah. Of nausea. Yeah. Um, until I finally like went to a I went to an uh, I think it was an op optometry op- optician yeah whatever had my inner pupillary distance measure oh, yeah yeah yeah. like played with it blah 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 but i almost had the exact experience that you were talking about yeah it made me good and sick when i first used it, it it's funny the last uh, uh not the last it's been a couple of years ago but I, I was having uh i was you know uh, getting fitted for new glasses and um and the uh the technician that i'm working with you know she's like you know putting this you know kind of like you know device on my eyes and she's like you know adjusting it and like getting blah 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 she's like writing numbers down and I, and I asked her, like, like I, I saw her like, you know, write down, like, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know. She like abbreviated it like, like, like IP or something like that. And like, like IPD. Yeah. And then like wrote this number down and I was like, is that my inner pupillary distance? And she kind of, you know, she gives me one of these like, uh, yes. <laughs> and I like, I was like, can, can, can I get that number? And she's like, uh, sure. And it's, she's like, why, why do you want it? Like, it's a VR thing. Like, you know, like you get like, VR, like, you know, you can like set up like the VR you know, goggles. To I remember when I went to the optician or optometrist or whatever the hell it was at the glasses store. And I said, Hey, I need to measure my inner pupillary distance, blah, blah, blah. And I explained to her why I was doing it. This is again, yeah. this is during purchasing of the development model right. of, of the Oculus, this the first Oculus rift way back. So nothing existed. And I told her that, and she looked at me like I had 10 heads. She's like, what are you talking right. about? Virtual reality. Who? What, what is that? What is that? Like, it was hilarious. Is that a is that a series on Netflix? Where are you streaming it? Anyway, yeah. So it's really. I mean, it's as you said, the Oculus Quest is cheaper now. But I just, you know, the the first compelling gameplay, uh, a game that I've that I've even seen that I'm kind of interested in is the Horizon game mm-hmm. um, on the PlayStation. But I I just don't. I mean, it's still. I think the the PS PSVR two um, is going to retail for what was it four hundred bucks? I think. I have to be 79, something like that. That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, it was, it was not cheap. It was like, you know, akin to the price of the console for the PS5. Yeah. Um, yeah they're saying 550. 550, right. My console was 399. Right. There you go. And so I'm just, I don't find the, I don't find the gameplay experiences or what I'm reading about the quality of VR to be compelling enough to pay $550 for. Yep. Um, it'll get there though eventually, I think, because there is, and there is a, I, I don't know. Well, uh, we'll see. I don't know. I think the fundamental thing for me is still, and uh, like I have mixed kind of feelings on this, but it's like, I guess the metaverse, you know, I mean like Facebook's chasing it. Epic games is chasing it in a big way. Um, others as well. But, uh, the thing that really excited me about VR going back to like ready player one was the idea of like a shared experience. The idea that you could create a, you could create a sandbox to play in with your friends that could be anything, you know, and it could change and, uh, you know, whatever, but like that, that notion, uh, you know, going back to like what we're talking about, like, like, like the, the base building thing and sons of the forest, you know, for me, Conan exiles, you know, everybody who's playing like Minecraft and stuff like that. The, you know, the idea that you could, uh, you could have like this really like amazing, like, you know, near photorealistic sort of game experience in this sandbox where you, are kind of in control of like, you know, what it looks like and how it works. And, you know, th- th- there's games within the game and, you know, that sort of thing. Like that's the, that's ultimately the thing that I'm kind of like waiting on from VR. And I, I don't, I mean, we're not, we're not there yet, but that is something that, that I'm kind of keeping an eye on. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, the thing that we read about in Ready Player One is is 100 years past where we are now, right? I mean, it involves haptics. Yeah. It involves, you know, you talk about photorealistic. We're not even close to that. The ability to manipulate all of that and, and the, you know. Um, and so I think the question is, does AR or VR, and so th- then there's the step below that, which is where we are, right? There's, there's no haptics. And so the the division between, you know, what, what you're seeing in your VR reality and what you're experiencing physically in, in your body and in the world, yeah, they're, they're just, they're separate, right? And so... Miles apart. Um, right, and I think when those two things come together and you actually sort of feel like you're in the world that you're describing, that's a whole different metaverse. Then you're talking about, like, real metaverse with yeah. where people will buy property and stuff. But um, until then, it's just sort of a separate experience, and the question then becomes... I'm curious to see, like, I'm unclear on which technology is going to get to the more interesting experience, uh, whether it's AR or VR, before that step when we include haptics and all that. Because AR is advancing pretty fast, and it might overtake VR for the sort of more, you know, the kinds of things that are kind of curiously interesting to do on these devices, like watch a movie right. that looks like you're in a movie theater on a movie screen, or, yeah. you know, work on your, do your desktop computer work, but have it on a 50-inch yeah. screen while you're sitting at a beach kind of thing. like. And I, I don't. I'm curious. I don't know which one of those two technologies will create that more compelling experience in the next five to ten years. Yeah. Before we get to what you're describing, which I think is many, many years away. Probably true. Um. All right. Well, what's next for you? Um. Other games I've been playing recently. Um. So there's a a couple. I'll talk just really quickly uh, uh, about Hogwarts Legacy, and then I'll jump into DMZ. Okay. I just want to mention Hogwarts Legacy because I probably put seven or eight hours into this, but um, if it's something that interests you at all, again, I don't know, Brent, are you a, a Harry Potter fan? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was a big fan of the books. And have you played Hogwarts or no? No, I haven't. I, I've seen a ton. Uh, I've seen a ton of, of of people, you know, kind of talking about, like, you know, Jess Condit. Like she, you know, she wrote, she wrote a pretty interesting review for it. You know, kind of, she called it like, you know, basically the Hogwarts game that she'd been imagining since she, like, you know, read the first book or saw the first movie, you know, whatever. But uh, she. Uh, she said it was pretty amazing and a number of other people have had some really glowing, you know, kinds of reviews uh, of it. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll just echo those because the reality, it, it, the best thing I the best way I can describe it to you, Brent, is that it's, it is red dead redemption. Wow. Um, it, and it is, a, it, it's of that quality and actually better uh, in a lot of ways. Amazing. Um, the only difference is, um, yeah, I'm not sure what I put it in my top one, two or three games of all time that I don't know because the games that are in there, I just think might never be unseated journey and, you know, red dead and, yeah. um, you know, w- w- a couple of the reasons that red dead is up there for me is uh, number one, the setting, uh, just the old West setting is something that really resonates with me in a very powerful way. Mm-hmm. Number two, red dead was, um, so one of the, it was the, was the first of a genre. I mean, I'm not saying it was the first game to ever do what it did, but it put together a lot of things that I don't think had previously been put together yeah. quite in that way before. Um, and, and has spawned a lot of copycats in the years since. And so Red Dead is sort of the first in a way that Hogwarts maybe isn't. Um, and then also, you know, the narrative of Red Dead, spoiler alert, the original Red Dead, um, I still think is one of the most brilliant things that I've ever uh, experienced in my life, which is, you know, playing through the entire game and then playing an epilogue as, as the son of the main character is just, I mean, it w- was so incredibly powerful. It was. Uh, that, um, that it really vaults red dead up there but other you know so red dead was really a leader in a lot of ways but speaking strictly mechanically so first of all it functions like red dead i mean it's it's essentially an open world game that has all those activities that you would that expect in a red dead game like you know leaf like uh, leaf gathering and hunting and (laughs) all that kind of stuff it's although it's got the hogwarts version of it yeah and then it's got 10 other things on top of that and they're not like it does have um things like red dead had you could play liars dice or you know games like that it has those but it also has a bunch of other side activities that are 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 not collecting um foliage or or hunting animals and they're not playing games but they're just a side activity like solving puzzles a certain you know merlin's puzzles or right stuff like that there's tons of that kind of stuff um there's uh which you can do at any point you could spend you could just like red dead from the basically from the beginning once you sort of unlock after the first hour or two, whatever, mm-hmm. you can start just doing that whenever you can go in and play two hours of that if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Or you can follow the story. Or it's also got, you know, 50, uh, 
awesome, funny, sad side quests, just the way Red Dead did. Really high quality side quests that have that are multi step and have a characters that are really interesting. And it has uh, now. So the play, the place where it um, exceeds uh, Red Dead is the combat is phenomenal. The combat is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I better than Red Dead's. The movement is better than Red Dead's. There's you get to fly around on a broom, which I love. Mm. Um, uh, um, it's really, I mean, it, 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 and it, 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 if you're if you're really into Harry Potter, it's it's will be everything you've ever wanted. Right. If you like me and you like Harry Potter, but you're not like crazy nuts about it, like my wife, um, you'll be really engrossed in it and love it. And if you don't like Harry Potter at all and you just want a good game in that style it's a fantastic game and then the other thing that it does as well as any game i've ever played in my life um similar to the way red dead did is it feels like you're playing a movie like the way the score brings you in and out of moments yeah. and um it, it feel the production value is through the roof um it's just i mean it just it's really 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 well done and it is like I said, I mean, other than that, I don't know the story yet because I haven't finished it, and um, you know, it wasn't it, it, it wasn't the first one to sort of develop this formula, um, and, and may and I do prefer the old west as a setting to Harry Potter, but I love Harry Potter. Yeah. Other than those three things, it is as good or better than Red Dead in every regard. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, amazing. really, really good. Yeah, and I'm still, I'm like. I think I have about 12 or 13 hours in the game and they're still introducing new mechanics. Wow. So it's, yeah. it's deep. It's a deep dive. It, it is. It's real. I, I just, it's very good. So I, I talked longer about it than I anticipated. I apologize. That just testifies to the quality. <laughs> That's right. All right. Uh, speaking of the lack of quality, uh, DMZ, this is, uh, this is call of duty. And Wait, did you just say lack of quality? D- d- is, oh, it must've been a Freudian slip. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just hating on I'm just hating on COD for the for the old time's sake of it. So tell me about uh, tell me about uh, COD and DMZ. Yeah, so I've been playing a ton of DMZ uh, and Call of Duty. I bought the game. Um, I did play. I, I bought the most recent Battlefield 2042 when it first came out, and yep. played quite a bit of it. But it was, as I'm sure you know, sort of um, famously not in a good place. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, Modern Warfare. 2019 was had a great multiplayer. It was fantastic, and so I knew I was going to get Modern Warfare 2. Mm-hmm. Bought the game, and it's fantastic. It's everything I hoped it would be. The multiplayer is fantastic, but it's DMZ is something completely separate and and uh, new to the franchise. It's an extraction shooter. It's like um, if if you guys don't know, it's like uh, uh, Warzone in that uh, you can access it for free if you want. It's a you can play Warzone and which I don't play, but you can play Warzone and DMZ for free um, if you paid for the game. You get um uh you don't get necessarily a gameplay advantage i don't think um but you have access to like blueprints and stuff that you wouldn't otherwise have it's not stuff that somebody couldn't build on their own but you just rank up faster and that kind of thing gotcha um so um but there's no gameplay advantage necessarily i don't think um but anyway it's an extraction it's an extraction looter shooter you go in you know you start out you go in naked or whatever you have no weapons no or you're taking a couple of of trash weapons and and a backpack with five slots in it and um and uh, uh you know a couple of grenades and that sort of thing and then you, you start looking for loot and you can get yourself from a five slot backpack to a double you can double the amount you can carry you can carry a third weapon you can your armor vest starts with one armor plate you can upgrade them to two or three armor plate vests and that sort of thing and i just it, man it's just and then there's a mission structure in there right so uh, there's three factions in the game, and you get missions anywhere that range anywhere from like, you know, kill kill three. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I should say it's a um, a PVE. So it's it's uh, in in the um, any given uh, uh, run of the game. There's God, I want to say I think it's sixty six players on the map uh, at one time, sixty six real players, and then the game is filled with bots as well. Right. Um, and you're fighting everybody, and so you might get missions that say kill three other players, or you might get a mission that says collect a, a tube of toothpaste, soothing hand cream, <laughs> and an emergency rations and right. exfiltrate with them. And so yeah. you have to go find these things and then get on an exfiltration helicopter. Um, when you call the exfil helicopter, a big, huge flare goes up in the sky, so everybody knows that you called it in. So now you now they're coming for you. you, know, you 
they may or may not be coming for you depending on where people are on the map and yeah. blah 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 and so um uh it, it's just it's really really well done and i i've just you know just been playing it like crazy uh and i it's it's fantastic i mean i don't know what else to say about it it's i mean people pretty much know what they get with call of duty although i, I you know it, if a first person shooter is at all interesting to you it's free to download I would say check it out. Warzone is not my jam. I don't like Warzone. Warzone's entirely PvP. Um and it's just, you know, it's Warzone is is there is a battle royale, you know. Yeah. Um shooter. Uh this is this is different and it's uh I, I think it's it's really well done. We've been playing it like crazy. I have to say that that that, that does sound more more appealing to me. Like I, I I like when there's like some mission variety and there's like different things like you know sometimes it's fine it's just like hey let's just you know you kill x number of enemies or whatever like that's cool but i love when they can kind of like mix it up and you know do like you know ha- you know do like a scavenging mission you know uh try to try to introduce you know just so, some new mechanics and stuff just get you kind of thinking just think it thinking differently about what you got to do and how you got to go about it that's that's always that's always yeah it's it is me. and it's it's a lot of fun and um there's been a lot of just um, just those fun gaming moments with your buddies where you're like, you just narrowly escape getting killed. Yeah, and yeah, narrow, yeah. I mean, I narrowly escape jumping on the chopper as it's starting to lift off and mm-hmm. three teams are, are coming down on you and about to take you out and no. you just barely get out. Or, That's the I mean, greatest. So, I've had so many of those moments, I can't even tell you. And, yeah. and you can, again, you could try it for free. You can just download it and you can play with us or whatever, like, you know, you can just check it out for free and see if you're into it. Um, it's just, I've, we've, you know what it reminds me of, Brent? It's like, over the years, uh, my good friend Aaron, who I mentioned on the show before, and I have played a lot of uh, Battlefield, mostly, yeah, but also Call of Duty titles. And, and it's just like, it's just fun gaming times with your friends, right? And there's just epic moments of pulling off crazy shit that you can't believe or you know, you're your buddies being attacked, and you come around the flank them around the back and take them all out or whatever. It, it is that it's just that it's that again, and it it was missing in Battlefield 2042. We played it, um, but there, it just wasn't that charm that that glee wasn't there. Um, and DMZ really, uh, really has it in spades. It's tons of fun. Cool. Say hi to Aaron the next time you see him. By the way, I will absolutely. I haven't talked to him in years. Well, maybe you should jump into DMZ. We need a third badly, Brent. Uh, when do you get well we'll talk we'll talk about we run, we run with a yeah we run with a we run with a uh it's trios the, the mode is trios and if you decide to play solo or with two people you're just at a disadvantage and so right aaron and i my buddy and i have been playing um uh as duos for a long time and we finally just said you know what we're gonna let them fill the squad because we're at too much of a disadvantage without having a third so you, we're just not that good you go rando for the third uh uh, we go rando for the third. Although I've played the tons of, I put tons of hours in the game solo too, and it was yeah. also fun. It's just a different game. You just got to move more slowly and be more methodical. We we can have we we can do a whole other podcast on rando experiences. <laughs> when Lance yeah. Neal and Fett and I were playing uh, uh, Rainbow Six Siege, you know, it's, it's like five, so it'd be the four of us, and like we get like some fifth rando, and psh, man, like some <laughs> some of the some of the fun that came out of that. It's been a very interesting ride with DMZ, like watching i've had some some of the best gaming moments in my my life in terms of like people being cool and helping each other out right there's a guy if you go on reddit there's a guy who runs a dmz taxi service <laughs> and he go, he goes in and like just looks for uh, he, he's got a got a special paint for his his vehicle skin and he goes in and he just looks for people to like shepherd them around the island and help them it's hilarious he's got the guy's written probably in a, a, a novella's worth of like tales of the taxi cab driver in dmz right. it's hilarious that's awesome um so we've had some real like just cool people and you can join uh so you start with a trio but you can build a squad of up to six you can invite players from another squad so if you roll in somewhere and there's other players and, you know you might go friendly friendly and if they say we're friendly it's cool and you might join up and make a six-man super squad <laughs> um cool. it, it's kind of, it's 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 cool yeah it sounds pretty fun actually yeah it is it's a lot of fun all right, so again, uh, in keeping with the haven't been gaming much lately, uh, one of the things that I did play, you know, going back to my love of uh, of like a turn based tactical and strategy games and stuff like that, I got into uh, I got into Hard West Two 
uh, late last year. I haven't, I probably haven't played in a few months at this point, but, uh, but late last year, uh, got into hard West two, which is, um, I don't know. It, it's, it's a real, it's a real mixed bag of a game. Like the, the fundamental gameplay mechanics I do, I do enjoy. And the setting, you know, it, kind of imagining something like an XCOM, you know, kind of turn-based tactical shooter kind of thing set in the old West, um, has got a lot of appeal. And, and you know, I mean, like it, it's definitely that whole sort of, uh, you know, like, like weird West genre, you know, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's the West, but it's, it's, it's mixed in with all kinds of, you know, like supernatural kind of folklore and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, which, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, like, I'm, I'm down with all that, but, um, it's mechanically there's, there's things about it that, uh, that are a little bit lacking. The, um, the voice acting is pretty hit and miss. I think that actually this was one of the last video game roles that Kevin Conroy had, uh, before he died. Um, so, you know, like some of the voice acting feels kind of spot on and then the, like, you know, some of the others are, you know, it's like, ah, it's kind of mediocre. It's not good. Not great. Um, I, I remember like back when the game came out, like there were people kind of like leveling this and, and like, I still see this. I still see this sometime. Like if you like go through like steam reviews and stuff, people were kind of like, it's not really a turn-based tactical game. It's more like a non-linear puzzle game. And, you know, they were just, you know, I think that, I think that, you know, the genesis of that is like, people were kind of saying that like, uh, you know, basically, you know, like the encounters are going to be, uh, the encounters are going to be the same, like every time. And, you know, like you just have to kind of figure, you know, like once you figure out the strategy, it'll work. And I don't think that's quite, I don't think that's quite fair. The, the encounters may always start the same, but you know, they, uh, I don't, I don't think that it's quite as, uh, it's quite what people are making it out to be, but anyway, having, I mean, but the game is not, the game's not perfect. I think it's got like a three and a half star, like rating or something like that, like on the steam store, it's firmly in the okay category, but, uh, for somebody who's like, you know, gone back and like, you know, played XCOM enemy unknown a couple times, uh, played the second one and is, you know, is, is now kind of like, well, like I really, you know, probably need to like, you know, dive into like that, uh, like the, what is it? Like the war of the chosen. And, you know, like there's, there's been like these amazing sort of like a expansive, like fan made mods for those games that are whole campaigns and stuff for somebody who really, really needs that turn-based itch scratched. Uh, hard West two was, th- that was a fun thing to dive into. Um, it kind of makes me want to go back and play the first one, which I didn't play. Uh, just because I've heard people comment that while hard West two has got some fun things going on about it, that maybe like on the fundamentals, the first game might be a little bit stronger. So anyway, uh, if you're into the, uh, if you're into the turn-based tactical thing, uh, hard West two is worth taking a look at. I think, it, I think it normally goes for like 30 bucks on steam. You know, if you get it on sale, probably even less, but, uh, it's, it's worth having a look. That was a game that I wasn't, um, that I was actually interested in, although I don't like, uh, turn-based games necessarily I even um i, I kind of was okay the only close to a uh, turn-based game that i had was um south park <laughs> which is i i know is i mean which, it is turn-based but it's, which one <laughs> it's the the first one i never got through the fractured butthole oh i mean the fractured butthole i just finished it last year like i like i i, I held off playing it for a long time just got i got busy but i i, I finished it last year it was, was it good? I, it was, I actually yes. played. It was amazing. I played the first part of it, and I lo- and I loved it. I just never. I don't know why I never finished it. Yeah, um, no, but it was really I was. Um, I was really looking forward to Hard West until I learned it was turn based. I actually thought it was going to be a yeah, an, an, a, a, you know, more like, again like Diablo and isometric, right? So, which is sort of what it looks like. But um, and I remember you and I. I don't know if you remember, but we had uh, a lot of conversation about XCOM, which was a game that you loved very much. I did. Um, and I and I tried to play it because of your love for it, and it, it just I couldn't get it to, I couldn't develop that love, even though I could see the quality of the game. I mean, it was clearly yeah. uh, very well done. Um, and when Hard West first came out, I was so excited uh, until I learned then it was a turn-based shooter. So when you said you wanted to talk about Hard West Two today, I was maybe hoping 
that they had changed, but it sounds like alas, they have not. They have not, unfortunately. Uh, it's a cool. It's a cool uh, setup, though. Yeah, it's cool. So, so there was one more thing you wanted me to talk about. Yes, I want to hear. Did you have, wait, did you have? Did you have another game before I do? Well, you know, I was gonna just. Uh, I was just gonna like throw out like. These, you know, like the games that I've kind of talked about so far, this is the stuff that I've played for myself, you know, like Hardwest 2 and South Park and, you know, that kind of yeah. stuff. Uh, but my daughter, Z, is she's at the age where she's really started to get into gaming in a big way. And f- for the most part, that's the, that's the Switch. She games on her, her iPad uh, a fair amount, but mostly she's gaming on the Switch. And that has really been awesome. Uh, because it's, it's stuff that we, there was stuff that we can finally kind of play together. And like, we've really, really gotten into like, like basically like all the Mario, all the Mario stuff, Mario Kart, Mario party. We are, we're a little over halfway through super Mario 3d world on the switch. The, The thing that kind of really started it is, uh, I got Mario plus rabbits kingdom battle. Cause it's a turn-based, you know, strategy game set in Mario. I'm like, Ooh, this, this looks fun. And, and also I, I, I love the rabbits and I thought like that, that'd be a neat mashup with like Mario. This could be really fun. And I got that purely for me. I mean, like I got a bunch of like Mario games and stuff for her that like, I just, I mean like when she was born, like we got a switch, like when she was like a year old and I was just like, look, we'll have this. Like one day she'll be old enough. She'll play it. It'll be great. And, uh, one of the games I got was Mario rabbits just for me. And, but, and I didn't play it for years. I'm I mean, like, I probably owned the game for two or three years before I ever sat down and played it. So by that time she's, you know, whatever she is like six, seven and she's watching me play and she's like, Hey, you know, can I play? And I'm like, well, it's not really multiplayer, but yeah, sure. Like, like, we'll just take turns. Like, like, you know, like I'll, I'll play as like Mario. And then like on your turn, you can play as, you know, princess peach or, you know, whatever you want to do. And so we just ended up sort of, you know, passing the controller back and forth each round of combat, taking a character and, and playing through the entire game more or less together. And it was an absolute blast, an absolute blast to kind of share that sort of gameplay experience with my daughter and, 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 you know, and like sort of trying to like, you know, train her up, you know, and and it's like, okay, don't just think about what you're doing now. Think about what you're going to do next. Think about, you know, think about this round, think about the next round, uh, you know, like think about what you can do to like set me up for, you know, my turn that's coming up next. Like, I'll think about what I can do to set you up for your turn, you know, and like just seeing her kind of begin to think a little bit more, uh, strategically and beginning to kind of like model future events and all that kind of thing. It was really, really interesting. So, um, the second game. Mario Rabbids Sparks of Hope. We, you know, we finished the first game so late in its life cycle that like the second game was like, oh, like, oh, this is coming out like next year, you know? And so, uh, you know, that game came out like in 2022 and, you know, we, we devoured it. Like we played that game, you know, in, in a handful of weeks and, uh, and finished it and, uh, had a great time. And, you know, like we're going back into like Super Mario 3D world. We're, we're working on an Odyssey playthrough. Um, so being able to share video gaming with my daughter is absolutely amazing. And, and I got to tell like, we just went and saw the Super Mario movie with some friends at the drive-in last night. And like all, you know, like, like, you know, Z's like right in the middle age range of like all, you know, this group of kids. And they're all like, you know, it's like, like, this is great. We love Mario and like all this kind of stuff. And I was just sitting here, I was sitting there at the movie thinking what a cool thing it is that that this this character this franchise has turned into like this multi-generational thing that like it doesn't matter kind of how old you are everybody can kind of love mario because everybody's got like some kind of like experience with like the mario franchise from some point in their life that was that 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 really meant something to them you know that, that was like a formative part of you know you know their gaming journey or whatever not everybody but most of us and uh it, it's been really special. I, I have to say that when I bought the Nintendo switch, when Z was like a year old, I told my wife, I'm like, Oh, this will be like a Christmas present to the family. And she's like, sure, sure it is. You know, like, <laughs> like that was kind of her attitude, but actually it has come to pass. Uh, and, and the switch is an amazing console. One of the, one of the, uh, you know, uh, hats off to Nintendo. 
you know, this sort of like it can either be docked and play it as a as a console on the TV, or you can you know pick it up out of the dock and take it anywhere you want and play it as a handheld is a pretty amazing thing. Which leads us into I, oh, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm listening to you say that, and I'm thinking, Red, are you are you doing this on purpose? Yeah, he is. Um, no, you're right. It it is it is a nice idea that Switch had that Steam has now perfected. <laughs> um, <laughs> fair, fair point. Fair point. I'm kidding. So. Um, let me just say, Brent, to, to your story, that's really awesome. I, you know, my daughter's five, and we haven't really, we've played a couple of games together. We tried Untitled Goose Game. Uh, we tried Hot Wheels together. She's a little young. Her hands are a little small for a PlayStation controller. Yeah. Um, uh, and, um, but she still had fun with it. What really lately, um, recently we've been playing Hogwarts, where she watches me play Hogwarts and tells me what to do. Um, you which know, it's been a lot of fun. But go ahead. I had the exact same experience with Z and Red Dead Redemption. The exact same thing. She would watch me play Red Dead, and you know she like you know she was really fascinated by like the horse riding, and she'd say you know go here you know like hey you know can, can you cross that river hey you can go up on that mountain you know she was watching me play yeah. and and re- was really fascinated by, uh, by that exact same kind of now thing. add about now add like the flying around on the brooms right yeah flying around on brooms and like weird monstery things and yeah and and using magic your magic wand to you know, be invisible or yeah, she, so we've had that, but we haven't yet quite gotten to the point that you're describing. And it's really, it's really special to, to I'm sure to, it's special to listen to. It's coming and, soon. I'm sure to experience. Yeah. It's coming. Um, soon. So your segue yeah. um, <laughs> about uh, the switch and the ability to go back and forth. The last thing that uh, we'll talk about in this section, Brent wanted me to talk a little bit about the steam deck because I have one. And um, Brent, what would you like to know? I'll, let me start there. I want to know before I start being, you know, spending thirty minutes being effusive on <laughs> Steam Deck. I want to know if it, you know, like, does the does it deliver on the promise? You know, like, is it is it a handheld PC gaming device where, like, I can I can sit here at home and I can I can play XCOM or something like that and be like, ah, now I'm gonna, you know, now I'm gonna, you know, go hang out with, uh, you know, the kiddos at the park. And while they're doing their thing, I'm going to, you know, play XCOM on my Steam Deck there. And then I'll come back and, you know, dock it and, you know, keep playing like on, on my desktop. Like, like, like that kind of like go anywhere and, and have your Steam game with you kind of experience. Does it deliver on that? Yes and no, but mostly yes. Um, and here's what I'll say to you. So number one, the Steam Deck is unquestionably the best first generation or first iteration hardware that I've ever purchased in my life, okay. far none. Um, I have seen other people, journalists and other uh, other posters, say that it is the best console they've ever purchased in their life right? or piece of gaming tech. Um, almost everybody in 2022 said it was the gaming tech of 2022, yeah. which I would say unquestionably. Um, and I would agree with that sentiment. It, it may be the best single gaming device I've ever purchased. Um, it is. It has exceeded my expectations. And, and my expectations, um, my buddy had gotten one about three months before me. I really didn't have any interest in one. Mm-hmm. Um, he got one like three months before me and did nothing but talk about how incredible it was for three months. So my expectations were pretty high, and it exceeded my expectations in every way. Um, so I'll tell you, to answer your questions more specifically, I, have, I purchased a dock, not the official dock, which is 90 bucks, a, a $29, $20 dock off of Amazon. Uh, that dock is plugged in via HDMI cable to my television and sits by my TV. Um, and I, um, 99% or 98% of the gaming I do is in my house with it. Um, I haven't done much traveling since I've gotten it. Um, I do take it out. Um, I'll take my daughter to, say, for example, dance class, and I just have to sit there for 45 minutes. So I'll just sit there and do that. But 95 or more percent of my gaming is done in the house. Mm-hmm. Um uh, almost all a uh, significant amount of that gaming, I am streaming the game from my home PC through the Steam Deck, so I can play it at um, 60 FPS. Depend whatever I, whatever my PC w- will play it at, I can play it at uh, on my Steam Deck. So I'll I'll lay in bed on the Steam Deck, and I can stream Hogwarts Legacy at full resolution at uh, you know 60 90 FPS on the Steam Deck. Nice. Um, I can do the same thing on my TV. Um, because as a stream, as a streaming device, it works um, amazingly. 
um, as a, a local device. So um, it is it is a PC. It is and it is newer hardware. So um, Hogwarts Legacy, which is a very resource intensive, very modern game, I could probably play locally uh, on the device, away, you know, in the parking lot or whatever, at thirty to forty FPS, depending. Steam has it's not too bad. Really interesting. Really interesting tools uh, in it to to frame lock. Uh, you can so you can change the screen to be a uh, sixty hertz, forty hertz, or thirty hertz, and then lock it at that frame rate to match the refresh rate. Right. Um, mostly, I I use forty hertz, um, and I can run most games that way. So again, I can run any game when I'm in my house. I can stream it from my home PC. I can run most games locally, uh, most newer games locally, um, and. All, like I put Metal Gear Rising on there just for fun the other day. Yeah. Um, uh, and I can play it at full everything because the game is six, seven years old or whatever. Right. Uh, Spider Man uh, Miles Morales is locally plays incredibly, incredibly on the Steam Deck and looks unbelievable. I mean, it's it is to me the killer app on that device. Um. Now, um. I will say there is, and it's just hard to explain or hard to understand without real, unless you're this kind of person. But uh, it uses Steam Big Picture. It's it's a it's a gaming PC basically, but it runs on Linux. Yeah, and so there's a Linux overlay, and so there are some things I have had to do to make some things work. And this is where I, you kind of get that yes and no. So, for example, any game that you're using through a third party service like Blizzard. Or, Ubis- or uh, Ubisoft or any of those kinds of things, Epic Game Store, um, requires some sort of back-end uh, tinkering to make it work. Okay. You know, Diablo, for example, Diablo 2 Resurrected, I bought as one, runs phenomenally on the device. But I had to switch it into desktop mode, and, which is another mode on the device in which you, it looks basically like a desktop and you can install stuff from the internet, just like a regular PC. Yeah. I had to switch to desktop mode, install the Blizzard client, do some finagling about the shortcut with the Blizzard client, and then switch back to gaming mode, which is the Steam Big Picture overlay mode that looks like a console, Yeah. Um, and launch the Blizzard client to then launch Diablo 2. Right. Um, and I had to do some tweaking, and it's a little bit convoluted, but once I did it, it took me maybe, you know, took me about 15 to 20 minutes to set up the Blizzard thing. Uh, from that point on, Blizzard games will all work. It's a one-time thing. Yeah. But it's not like when you have third-party launchers like that, it's not 100% plug-and-play like, oh, I can just buy Diablo on Steam because you can't. Or even games that you do buy on Steam, like, so for example, Far Cry, which launches uh, Ubisoft Connect in the background. Yeah. Those, they don't just work. Um, and so there is some tinkering still. The device is very clearly in its first iteration. Um, and so it's not perfect, but it is incredible and if you're willing to do a little bit of that you know, all you do is all i did was go watch a video on youtube a guy walks you through step by step yeah do this click on that push that button put it there do th- i mean i just followed the step-by-step tutorial and and it worked it, um it sounds to me like uh, if, you, if you're coming to the device from a pc gaming background none of that's going to surprise you none of that's going to be a big impediment you, you know you're used to like having half a dozen different launchers, you know, for different, uh, you know, different game, game publishers stuff already. Uh, but if you're maybe coming from the console side, maybe that's going to feel a little bit clunky. Yeah, a little bit, but uh, again, it's avoidable. And if you, um, yeah, so, I mean, so there's that, but uh, beyond that though, it, I mean, again, I mean, I was sitting in the parking lot at my daughter's dance class playing miles, Spider-Man miles Morales. And I don't know if you remember, you've played that game, yeah? I've not played Miles Morales. I, play, I played the, the first one, like, like just, you know, Spider-Man. Okay. And do you remember when you first started playing Spider-Man, how impressed you were with how good it looked and how well it played and how amazing the, oh, oh yes. the draw distance on the city was and all that? Well, Miles Morales is even better. Yeah. Um, and I played that entire game on the PlayStation and, and loved it. And then I played it on the Steam Deck, and I spent the first three hours reliving that feeling of being just amazed at how good it looks and plays on the steam deck i mean it's just it's incredible and i was playing it in the parking lot of of my daughter's dance class you know and then i came home got into bed 30 45 minutes before i wanted to go to sleep pulled the device out and was streaming hogwarts legacy from my computer 
playing it at full resolution at 60 plus FPS, yep. uh, laying in bed. And then I turned it off and went to sleep and set it next to me. Honestly, that, like, that sounds like an experience that I could, I could see myself having with it. Um, certainly, you know, in the past, like, you know, if I, if I'm playing like Red Dead or something, I'm basically monopolizing like, you know, the big TV in the living room. And, uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to do that. You know, like, you know, my, my wife might want to watch something, you know, Z might be into, she's really into YouTube and there might be something she wants to watch. So the idea that like, you know, we could all kind of be sharing that time together. We could all be doing something, but you know, I could be, you know, I could be doing my thing, you know, with the steam deck in my steam deck in my lap. I could definitely see myself doing that. Now, one question I do have though, uh, how is it with games that don't have native controller support? Um, I, you know, the, the community develops, uh, controller layouts, but I don't know. I don't know. Steam, steam, um, rates every game on the steam page. You can go look and it says playable, verified, um, playable or not supported or something like that. And it will tell you for each game individually, you click on that yeah, and it'll say, we rated it this way because the text is too small or there's no native control support or whatever. Um, I don't know the answer to that question because I haven't come across that. Okay. How I don't think I've come across that. How are the, uh, wh- wh- what do they call it? Like sort of like, like the, like the track pads or the touch pads. They're amazing. I'm I haven't, curious it's kind of that. funny because you, you don't really use the, I haven't used them much. Right. Um, I use them in desktop mode, but they're super responsive and very, um, uh, the tactile, they feel great. Um, I just haven't had to use them. Have, could you kind of compare, contrast those with the Steam controller? Did you ever have one of the Steam controllers back when they I were didn't. doing those? I didn't. No. I was actually no. pretty impressed. Like I played, uh, I played The Witness. Uh, you, you remember that, like that, that first person puzzle? Yeah. Uh, I played The Witness on the Steam controller. It, it, like you know, I've got like one of like the Steam. Uh, or the, uh, what was the Steam Deck? You remember the, the, those little uh, boxes? It was just like to stream. Oh, the, the streaming device. Yeah, yeah just yeah. to stream from your PC to your television. I played the the witness 100% again with Z. Like, like that was actually like one of those early games where she was like kind of sitting on the couch next to me watching me play and like saying like do this, try that, you know. And uh I played that with uh, with the Steam the Steam controller. And I was actually pretty impressed at how you know just like like the the way that it kind of felt from a tactile sensation standpoint and and as a replacement for mouse and keyboard, you know, for like a like a first person uh, shooter style game. Uh, I was, I, I, I was kind of skeptical about it going in, but discovered that it, actually the tech is pretty good. And I was imagining that if you, uh, you know, obviously, you know, most modern you know games are going to have controller support, but if you were playing a game uh, where you, you know, needed to kind of use like a mouse and keyboard and had those to fall back on, I was just kind of wondering if if they were as good or even maybe better than what I experienced. Yeah, I don't know. I can't speak to the comparison, but they're very good and very responsive. Cool. Again, I haven't used them. You know, I think I do think this the device. Uh, and I was really, again, really skeptical. It's four hundred bucks. It's the price of a console. I own for the low end one, six hundred for the one with more memory. I just bought the low end one and put a a, a terabyte memory card in it. Um, but which cost me fifty bucks on Amazon. But um, uh, the you know I have a PS five. I have a, a newer new gaming computer. I thought, do I, do I really need this for $400? It's pretty, you know, I thought, I mean, it's pricey for my situation. It's not right. pricey for the device. And I got it, and I would spend the money uh, 100%. I would spend it again and twice on Sunday. It is, I, I, I actually thought if I had to, would I get rid of my PS5 in favor of this? I, I just might because it's, I mean, it is, it is everything you want it to be in that regard. You can go from, you know, playing on the device outside of the house, playing on the device in the side of the house, and then playing on the device on your TV, using the device. So I play it on my TV using my PS5 controller. Oh, yeah. Um, I like that. With it docked. And it and it plays, I mean, it's like playing on the PS5. Yeah. Only the visuals are better and the frame rate is higher. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's incredible. And I have to imagine developers, you're already starting to see this. Um, developers are going to start developing towards the device. It's sold, I think, over a million devices a million units in the first year it was the top um top seller above all the vi- any games or anything on steam for months and months and months um i mean it's they couldn't keep up and it's i mean it's just it is a hundred percent um everything you want it to be i think it, it as long as you're willing to do a little bit of a little bit of tinkering and and, and they update it const they're updating it constantly and make 
significant changes. So games that they've been very responsive. They're they're being very aggressive with the pro, with the uh, program to verify it and to get things working with it. And so games will come out, they won't work, and then two or three days they'll be fixed. They'll be somehow fixed to work on the deck. Um, Steam is really really attentive to the device, and it's 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 amazing, and it's it's hard to understand. I, you know, honestly, the the biggest the biggest way the two biggest ways in which it's impacted my gaming are one i can now buy something on a on a single platform and feel comfortable that i can play it on my tv in some other room of my house or while i'm traveling oh that's, yeah, that's a cool point i hadn't really thought about that but that's a great that's a great point and that was not yeah, that was not always an easy thing to accomplish no and now i you know if yeah. i can buy it in one place and it's brilliant by steam because i honestly brent this is kind of strange but I mean, I have a huge library on Steam, but I pro- I don't think I bought a Steam game in eighteen months or more. Right, and then I got the device, and now I bought ten in the last two months. But um, the other, and then the other thing is, um, is that the the playing in bed thing has been a big deal for me because, um, like I said, it allows me to get into bed at the end of the day and play for thirty minutes while I'm in bed, and then just turn it off and roll over. Mm-hmm. Whereas previously, if I wanted to sort of unwind in that way. I would be in the living room or sitting at my desk where I'm more likely to keep playing for more time as, you know, an hour, maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, right. um, this it's sort of changed my routine a little bit or allowed me to change my routine in a, in a very positive way. And like I said, it's, it's just, it's cool to sit in bed and play a triple a game like miles Morales, um, in full resolution on this hand, seven inch handheld. It's really incredible. Well, you know, I've also heard pretty glowing stuff, uh, you know, from Fett. He, he, he got in, you know, like pre-ordered, like, you know, one of the, you know, one of the early ones back when they were, you know, really hard to come by. They were sort of like coming out, I guess, like in waves and stuff, uh, early on. And he got one pretty early and, uh, I, I've, I've picked his brain about it too. And he, he also has uh, quite good things to say about it. Yeah. I don't, I can't, I just, I can't imagine somebody being disappointed by the device. It really, like I said, I mean, I, at this point, I would even consider if I had to make a choice, I would consider getting rid of my PlayStation for it. Yeah, uh, well, PlayStation. You know, there's uh, PlayStation has some very unique experiences, right? That that Sony um, is amazing at developing, but also uh, which I wouldn't want to miss a out. lot of their first party titles. Uh, they're supporting the PC more and more and more. They're starting to uh, yes. as time goes on, and and yep. you're seeing you know things like you know Horizon and God of War and you know that stuff coming to PC. That's uh, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, so it's it's incredible. It's really an amazing device, and I'm not. I do not regret having gotten it at all. Cool, very cool. Yep. Yeah. So, um, the the timber of the show, you know, kind of began with you know the 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 end of an era. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll say you know with the with the uh, the closing of the uh, the outlawgamers.com website. We come now to what what might portend. Uh, another end of an era, and that is uh, that is E3, the Entertainment Electronics Expo, uh, which uh, has been canceled uh, for 2023, as I'm sure uh, most of you listening are already aware. Um, it it speaks to a number of things uh, that are going on both in the world uh, and in and in gaming specifically, and I think that I, I mean you know. That doesn't mean that you know E three is gone forever or whatever, but the fact that they have canceled this year's uh, show, and the fact that you know that was preceded by basically all the major publishers, you know, pulling out of the show, um, it's it's just kind of interesting. I mean, like E three has been a really really big and imp- important uh, tentpole in gaming, you know, for a, a really long time. I mean, like my first E three was nineteen ninety eight, I think. And, uh, but it's one of those things where like, as time has gone on and technology and web services, things like that has developed, most of the companies have gotten to the point where like, they don't really need E3 anymore. You know, they can go direct, you know, like, like Nintendo, uh, it, it's really interesting actually to kind of like watch Nintendo as a company and to kind of see like where Nintendo goes first, often other people will follow. Uh, and, you know, Nintendo was, you know, one of the first major publishers to say like, look, like, you know, we can, we can do this on YouTube. We can do what we need to do directly to our audience. We don't need, you know, we don't need to spend all this money and 
all this uh all this pomp and circumstance with e3 and you know over the over the last several years like more and more people have kind of figured that out too obviously i think you know covid and the pandemic and uh just uh the, the possibility of having a big gathering like this not being on the table uh probably hastened things but uh it's it's interesting uh, how how do, how do you feel about you know like where e3 is right now and where it where it might be uh in another few years yeah it's it's a hard it's a hard question i i the the glory days of e3 have been gone for a, a while as you as you alluded to and um the truth is is um I, there's a good possibility e3's gone permanently they haven't said that they just shut down for this year yeah there's a great video that i think you're going to link to um that skill up did on his youtube channel along with a couple of his friends including alana pierce but um, about their theory as to why E3 is over. And a lot of it centers around, or at least from skill up standpoint, uh, Jeff Keeley actually, and the idea that Jeff has, um, between what you said, Brent, about their ability to do it virtually, and that Jeff has created these other events um, that uh, allow the, the studios to do what they would normally do at E3, um, that there is no real need to do E3 anymore. Not that Jeff was like out to get E3 or anything, but... There's just these other places for for studios to go, and yeah, um, it, it made some sense to me, and so I think there's a good chance that E3 is 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 done for. I don't know, but the, the truth is, is it makes me sad personally. Um, uh, I, only because I love used to love E3. Yeah, I love going to E3. Uh, the one time I had the opportunity to go, there was just something magical about E3 and about that that time when um, you were just sort of clamoring for the news to come out over those two or three days. Um, and there were big, big, big announcements about games and many surprise announcements. And, and uh, um, I like Jeff Keighley. I, like, I think Jeff Keighley has done a lot for our industry. Um, um, but there's something missing, I think, from his events that just doesn't feel, doesn't have that same magic, I don't feel like, that E3 did. And so I'm sad. I'm sad that, that it's going away. I wish, but as I said, I think it went away a few years ago. Yeah, it, it, it did. I mean, it was, it was on the decline already. Everybody knew it. Everybody could see it happening. And, you know, just the, the, the news cycle around E3 became less and less special as, as publishers and developers began to realize that, you know, we don't have to kind of put all our eggs in one basket. We don't hold, we don't have to hold this announcement for E3. As a matter of fact, we can do it, you know, a week or two weeks before E3, or we can wait till a month after, and we've got the new cycle to ourselves, you know, just, and, and I mean, that's just, like I said, that's, that's everything. That's, that's the whole world. That's, you know, he, you know, here we are, you know, 30 years on from the internet, you know, and all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's just everything. Everything is is finding you know new ways to to work and be effective and the the marketing of games the the announcement of, of games and, and you know, giving people that feeling of you know some big big new thing coming uh that's that's just changed and e3 e3 was a super super cool event and at one time it was a crucial event in the way that a lot of industry expos are you know the the way that you know things like this uh, got started, or you know this, or CES, or the um, what's the one that <laughs> they always uh, they always uh, used to televise these on uh, on one of the one of the Discovery Network uh, shows, but the the one it's, it's like a like the home and bath fitting expo or you know whatever. <laughs> uh, but you know all of these events started off as as trade shows where. Uh, manufacturers and distributors would come and say, here's what we got. And retailers, uh, and, and wholesalers would, you know, come in and, and say, okay, you know, we, we're going to buy a ton of these cause we know that our customers are going to buy the shit out of them. And, you know, e E3 started the same way and yeah. it's just, I, I mean, you know, forget about, you know, just developers, you know, using YouTube, going straight to the to the consumer, I mean, just like the entire business model, uh, you know, of games. I, I mean, like you can remember, like back during the Epic Battle Axe days, we were talking about like the prospect of wholly digital games no longer having physical media and all that stuff. And, yeah, and right. I, I mean, like, like yep. that—that's completely gone. Like, like, like that discussion's totally behind us now. Uh, so, yeah. like, like you know, just like the retail video game business 
is all but gone. And, uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's just a different world and, and it, 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 there just might not be a need for E3 to exist in it anymore. As much fun as it was, uh, to experience and to be a part of during the heyday, uh, it, it just might simply be a casualty of, of evolution. Yeah. I think, you know, it reminds me a little bit of sort of where we're at with, with our website in this show, which is, um, you know, having you reach out and say, Hey, we need to close down the website. You know, we said goodbye to this many years ago. Yeah. Um, but there's another milestone in saying goodbye to it a little bit. And it's, it's sweet in that you think about the good times, but it also hurts a little bit because you love it so much. I feel the same way about E3. Like I, I you know, I, I haven't really watched E3 in the last few years and I certainly haven't watched it with the, um, zeal that I, that we used to. Mm. And so I, I feel like I said goodbye to E3 a number of years ago. And now hearing that it might actually be closing down sort of takes me back to the good times. Um, but it's sort of like just a sort of a sad final note. And I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I agree with you. Is it, ne- is it necessary? Uh, obviously not because they're not doing it and they're, but there's, they still need to make announcements like that. And they still try to build hype around it. And they still need to reach out to their people to, to their consumers and, and they're doing that they're looking for other ways to do that i just don't think it's as exciting as what e3 did and so i do think there would still be value in an e3 because there's there's a hype factor that i feel like is missing from the gaming industry or is gone from the gaming industry um as compared to you know five eight years ten years ago um right but i don't know maybe, maybe that's also just me getting older or me paying less attention um you know maybe, maybe it's not missing and i it's just changed for me i'm not sure but um, I, I will be sad to to say goodbye to E three when it does finally go. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, but uh, you know, such such as it such as it is, such as it goes. Such is life. That's right. That's right. How about we look forward a little bit, Brent? I'm all about looking forward. Uh, <laughs> what should we look forward to, Lauren? I I just when we were making up the doc for today, I just wanted to throw a couple games out there that I'm looking forward to because uh, I'm very excited about them, and we don't need to get in them too deeply, but um two things just sprung to forward in my mind diablo 4 is coming out um soon june 6th june 1st if you bought the upgraded edition nice um or f- second or something um and i don't did you play the beta for that brent i have not uh i i've 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 heard a bit about it like uh yeah. fet pay, uh, fet played it and I, i've watched a little bit on youtube yeah it's very very good and, and i am just very very excited for diablo 4 uh to come out and then I tripped over a game that was, I think it was announced in middle of um, March, I think. I, like, I was only recently announced. It's coming out in May. Um, and that is a new game called Lego 2K Drive. Oh, yeah. Which. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, okay. I, I noticed, Go ahead and stop. Take my money. Keep talking. I, it, it sounds like a, a strange thing. At least it did to me. I'm not a huge Lego. I don't play the Lego games very much, but. Um, I watched this. I watched a trailer for this game, and it's a. It's essentially like I, uh, Burnout Paradise meets um, Mario Kart meets uh, Legos. Mm. Like it, it, it's an open world racing game uh, in which your vehicle changes based on the terrain you're on. So if you like drive from land to sea, it'll turn into a boat or whatever. Um, and of course, you can buy all sorts of weird like you know hamburger boats and or you know hamburger cars or blah blah. But the thing that really made it in- interesting to me is it, is that it's all in Lego world, and yep. so um, everything breaks. So uh, there's no like crashing your car into the railing like there are in racing games, or smashing it into the side of a building, and you have to start over. At least that I can see. Um, and you just sort of plow through everything, and everything breaks around you. And so I thought this is a perfect game to play with my daughter. Yep. Who I tried to play Hot Wheels Unleashed with, but it was a little bit too complex. Yeah. Um, here she can just smash through everything, and and then I started looking into it. The mechanics are, it's it's a quite a deep little game in terms of like it's a it's a legit open world driving game like Burnout Paradise or something with right. races and goals, and it's got five biomes and blah 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 blah. I mean, it's a it's a legit game that they've been working on for four or five years or something. Um, just in Legoland, it just it just made me every time I've watched a trailer, I'm just having an ear to ear grin on my face. So I'm kind of looking forward to that too. And that's that's exactly what I was kind of thinking about. Like you know, when we were talking about this before 
recording was uh this seems like exactly the kind of game that z and i could could get into and uh and maybe have a lot of fun with so let me know how it goes um i will for my own part you know in the vein of um in the vein of of things that z and i might play together there's a, a switch game called uh a switch game coming out called disney illusion island that kind of kind of keeping an eye on z is not hugely into disney stuff um and so it, it's it's one of those where like from a character standpoint kind of like take it or leave it maybe but uh we we've you know like she she's seen some youtube stuff on it we've we've looked at it a little bit but that's one that we're kind of kind of keeping our eye on but you know it's um is it do you say it was switch specific or exclusive i mean uh you know that's actually a good question i th- i think it's i think it's uh i think it is but i am not i'm not sure it, it's possible it might be on another platform and i'm just not aware of it but anyway um i'm sure yes, it's switch specific yeah so anyway but it, you know it, it's a it's like co-op i think like up to four players and stuff you know so like we're always kind of like basically z and i are always sort of on the lookout for like fun switch co-op games that we can we can maybe you know kind of dive into we're always sort of looking for like the next fix of that uh for my own part uh i gotta say that uh for me for this year the uh the the big one is is Baldur's gate three i you know obviously going back many many years like you know turn-based turn-based tactical games, turn-based like role-playing games. Like that is my fucking jam. And, uh, XCOM divinity, original sin Two. I mean, like those are like, you know, that, that's like the pinnacle of the genre for me so far. And, uh, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm huge into D and D, uh, you know, or again, like after, after many years away, I've been running a, a weekly game for going on three years now, or sort of like, you know, in the bottom half of this multi-year campaign that, my group's been doing so you know D has been very much on my mind uh despite the the best efforts of those greedy bastards at wizards of the coast but you know never mind um but baldur's gate 3 i i'm really really looking forward to that when we were playing divinity original sin 2 i can remember saying like i like like i love this don't get me wrong i love this but if they could actually do this sort of like in the D D mythos and you know use some of those things as opposed to just having to kind of come up with their own versions of stuff this would be amazing and i kind of feel like you know that that wish is coming true when does it come out uh august i think let me august let me let me see if well you just out of curiosity will you play diablo is that a game you'll play you know i i keep thinking that i need to like give diablo a try and see uh see if i'm into it because like everybody yeah it's it's august 31st uh for baldur's gate 3 i really need to give diablo a try i have not i have pro- i don't think i've played diablo since diablo 2 i'm trying to remember i i don't think i played 3 i don't remember playing 3 so it's one of those games that i really should try to kind of you know come back to uh because there's a lot of elements of diablo that i know i like yeah so okay i was just curious um it does come out in June if you decide you want to play before uh, Baldur's Gate because it sounds like once Baldur's Gate comes out, it's going to be all Baldur's Gate all the time for a while. That's probably true. Yeah, I, I got to get it ahead of time. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, yes, have we've we come ha- to the end of another recording? Have we come to the end? Uh, you know, uh, I think that I think we might have to do another one of these because you know we were going to do uh, which we just kind of ran out of time. Uh, we were going to talk a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence. And how generative artificial intelligence is, uh, it's, it's got a lot of people's attention. Uh, it's got a lot of people scared and it's definitely going to be having a big impact on the world in general. And I think gaming as well. And, uh, that, that might be a, a topic of discussion that we can dive into on, uh, perhaps a future episode. Of Outlaw. Yeah, this is already, I think, one of our longest episodes of all time. That's true. Well, we had a lot uh, to say. Yeah, we did. So we did. It's been five years. That's right. Built, um, lots of buildup. But anyway. That's right. Well, Brent, thank you so much, man. It's so great to talk to you. I'm so uh so excited uh to to see you and talk to you again and for the community to get to 
it, one more episode of Outlaws to the End. That's one more in the bag. It was fantastic to talk to you. I, I mean, we hadn't talked in a little while uh, before we got on the phone to you know just sort of talk about what was going on with the website and stuff. And um, and the second that you picked up, uh, it was it was just I was just laughing, grinning ear to ear, uh, as you said. It was so much fun to reconnect and uh, and to and especially to you know kind of talk about this stuff, talk about gaming and whatnot. It's always always been one of the highlights of uh, of my podcasting career was to to share to share the microphone with you so thank you so much for doing this and uh and let's do it again before we turn 85 indeed and thank you to everybody we look forward to the new um iteration of the community on discord please head over if you're still listening to this podcast and haven't uh passed out fallen asleep or died please uh because our audience is getting older with us you gotta remember that too. <laughs> it's- it's true. Those, those poor, those poor <laughs> pastors. I have to wonder if we're gonna if we do this from the nursing home or wherever when we're eighty five. <laughs> are we gonna have an eighty five year old audience listening to us? You know, talk about games. It'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. Will we? Start? Uh, indeed. <laughs> so, gang, uh, thank you for rolling with us yet again. Thank you for rolling with us over the years. Uh, we love you all, and uh, and we we couldn't and wouldn't do it without you. So. Uh, if you've got anything that you want to let us know about this episode, leave us a comment because I'm just discovering that I'm going to have to basically create some sort of like channel or something on the discord server to post episodes so that people could comment on episodes since we're not going to have the website to do that anymore, which in theory, in hindsight, I should have figured out, uh, before this moment, but here we are and we'll look forward uh, to seeing what you all have to say. As we move forward, thanks so much again for rolling with us. Uh, We'll see you again at some point, I'm sure, with another episode of Outlaws to the End. Until then, he's Lauren Baumgarten, I'm Brent Adams, and you stay the most epic community in gaming.